Modern technologies have enabled man to peek into the past like never before. Numerous discoveries have thus far been made, many of which, as we predicted, continue to reinforce our posit of past civilizations being once far older, greater in occurrence, and some in size and indeed technological prowess than currently academically stated, notably expanding recognized scales of many of these ancient cities. We believe these often remarkably ingeniously laid out settlements, now buried under millennia of strata, were sometimes either partly re-inhabited leaving later relics, or simply have surviving sections piercing the ground strata, foliage, and tree levels. Guatemala, a perfect example of this. Submerged beneath impenetrable forest, yet dotted with towers once argued as separate ruins, built in honor of various things, now realized thanks to LIDAR as one once enormous mega-metropolis. Furthermore, this ancient claimed Mayan site, amazingly, does not hold the title for possessing the largest single ancient structure possibly on Earth. Although buried under several meters of Earth, LIDAR has revealed the site as Eguadar Phoenix, a structure of astonishing proportions has been found, scanned, and measured. Discovered to be over 4,500 feet long and 50 feet in height, the platform of its roof alone would have taken a stunning expanse of space, and the research being undertaken to understand yet another mega-metropolis which surrounded the structure are finally forcing an overdue change in long-held, stubborn, ignorant, and to us, long-opposed paradigms regarding who, when, and indeed how ancient people accomplished such achievements. Researchers stated, quote, Aguada Phoenix is by far the most sprawling ruin, end quote. They continued, In fact, after three years of study, we have determined that it's by far the largest and very probably the oldest Maya structure ever found in Mexico. These quotes, however, raise some curious questions, although the research thankfully transparent in nature, sharing the incredible discovery with the world, if indeed the oldest structure ever found, one has to remember it is also one of the most incredibly massive and clearly one of the most complex architecturally constructed structure as well. The question, how is this logical? We feel a contradictory statement, unless one perceives the past as our channel argues it once was. We will keep you posted on the discovery. We find it highly compelling. The figurines of Ocambaro, a series of artistically driven figurines that perplex all who have the opportunity to examine them. They were discovered by German Waldemar Julstrold in July of 1944 within Acambaro, Mexico. They represent, among other things, unknown camels, animals, enormous ancient reptiles, and possibly even aliens. Various examples from the collection are currently on public display at the Museum of Acambaro. Charles Hapgood, historian of science at Keene College in New Hampshire, best known for his discoveries regarding the Piri Reis maps and ancient Antarctica, has also supported the claim that the figurines are genuine ancient artifacts, which show extinct animals, miniature goblin-esque creatures, and quite possibly ancient extraterrestrial beings. Due to these claims, and the many skeptics who were ferociously arguing against such a posit, Official radiocarbon dating was arranged and conducted in the late 60s, using organic materials from their surfaces. However, to academia's chagrin, the results indicated dates of around 6,500 years old, this based on three samples. Yet, amazingly, the results were ignored in favor of persistence, that they are nothing but modern souvenirs, made for the tourist industry. None of the publicly displayed examples resemble any known extinct dinosaur. Instead, it is suggested that they are representations of once-living animals. Although the carbon dating had proven their authenticity, skeptics were still arguing that they were a modern hoax. A few years later, thermoluminescent tests were agreed upon by all, 
as being sufficient enough to establish the figure's approximate date of manufacture. So, in 1972, Froelich Raming of Pennsylvania Museum conducted this analysis. He also obtained dates of well over 4,500 years. Indeed, even their excavation was observed by a trained archaeologist known as Charles de Peso. It seems that no matter what certain individuals try in their attempts to discredit the authenticity of the Acambaro figures, all they seem to accomplish is validating them further. Although some of the more compelling figures have disappeared over the years, the vast portion of these mysterious and perplexing artifacts remain on public display. Who made the Acambaro figures? What do most of them depict? With attitudes as they are within mainstream academia, it's a battle to establish the facts surrounding such relics. A battle we are slowly winning. Rising nearly 400 feet above the desert floor in a remote section of New Mexico within ancient Anasazi territory is a place named Chaco Canyon, and within stands an imposing natural structure called Fajada Butte. Hidden from the world for over 700 years along a precarious narrow ledge, there lay a secret, ancient, astronomical observatory. Subsequently given the name Sun Dagger, and the reason why is nothing less than remarkable. It has been revealed that for more than a thousand years, the Sun Dagger has been revealing to all aware of its creation the subtle changing of the seasons. In 1977, it was thankfully rediscovered when rock art and petroglyphs were spotted nearby. Anna Sofer, who was cataloging the rock art, was one morning greeted by the Sun Dagger, slowly traveling across the wall, traversing the strange spiral patterns which were etched upon them. The intelligent Anna realized that the Sun Dagger could have been connected to the petroglyphs, so along with her colleagues, she came back at various dates throughout the year, eventually establishing the following information. On the summer solstice, the Sun Dagger appears near the top of the largest spiral, and over a period of 18 minutes it slices through the very center, cutting the spiral in half before leaving it in shadow for another year. On the winter solstice, two daggers of light appear lasting for 49 minutes, during which they frame the large spiral. Finally, an equally fascinating and more complex light show occurs on the spring and autumn equinoxes. The large spiral is carved in such a way that counting from the center outward to the right, there are nine grooves. On each equinox, a dagger of light appears that cuts through the spiral on different angles. Meanwhile, a second dagger slices through the center of the smaller spiral. These light shows, which had been going on for centuries, continued for several years after their rediscovery. However, in 1989, it was found that the granite slabs had shifted. The alignments that had been arranged so carefully were no more. It also seems impossible for us modern people to realign them as all attempts have failed. Was this sun dagger really made by the Anasazi Indians? Or was it a far older surviving relic, one that they were merely aware of? a relic which has unfortunately eroded away. Similar ancient light displays marking the solstices and equinoxes can be found at other locations as well, such as in the southwestern United States and Mexico. In a ruin in Hovenweep National Monument, near the borders of Utah and Colorado, light beams also illuminate spiral petroglyphs on the summer solstice. At Burrow Flats in Southern California, a winter solstice sun points a finger of light to the center of five concentric rings in an early Chumash rock art display. Were these monuments once used by a lost, ancient advanced group of marauders as calendar sites while traveling America? Perhaps one day we will know for sure. Thanks for watching, guys, and until next time, take care. In 1910, construction workers in Mexico were building an insane asylum atop of what they presumed was an ordinary mountain. Upon digging into the earth, they almost immediately discovered the ruins of an extremely ancient structure. It was later realized, yet not largely shared with the world, that the hill is actually what is now classified as the largest pyramid on earth. Hiding under the grass, trees and many tons of earth sits the once lost and now found Great Pyramid of Cholula. With a base four times the size of the Great Pyramid of Giza, just how did this amazing monument get lost to time? Also, why is it more heard regarding this enormous structure within modern academia?
It sits just outside Puebla, the fourth largest city in modern-day Mexico. It is 450 meters wide and 66 meters tall, with a floor area comparable in size to nine Olympic-sized swimming pools. Not only is this structure the largest pyramid on Earth, but it is also officially and undeniably deemed the largest monument ever built on our planet. In 1519, Hernán Cortés, a Spanish invader, had his men march into the great Aztec city of Cholulu. They subsequently massacred 10% of the population and built a tiny church on top of the hill as a symbol of their conquest. The church they built is now known as the oldest continuously occupied building in North America. Historical records suggest that when Cortés arrived in Cholula, the pyramid was many thousands of years old and already entirely overgrown by vegetation. Additional legends state that the Great Pyramid was so sacred to the Cholula people that they covered it with soil in order to hide it from Cortez's army. We may never know how it became buried under the sediment it now rests beneath. Experts believe the pyramid grew in stages, successive civilizations improving on what had already been built. When an old pathway was removed in 2013 to make access for a drainage system, workers reportedly uncovered at least 63 complete and very ancient skeletons. Some of these remains accompanied by numerous alien-looking skulls absent their skeletons. Ancient myths from the region told of giants building the structure, with the city's inhabitants being of normal size. From the 1930s until today, great efforts have been made to fully excavate the pyramid. Although these excavations rarely gain any media attention, regardless of the pyramid's enormous size and possible importance, over five miles of tunnels have been dug inside the structure, all open to the public if you can get in them, as locals have reportedly reclaimed the pyramid as their own. Even though extensive exploratory research has been undertaken, the age or indeed the possible builders remain an elusive mystery. Just what type of tombs could still be buried beneath the largest officially classified pyramid on Earth? Were alien remains really found amongst the ruins? And if they were, why was the world kept in the dark regarding the results of this testing? Official reports released at a much later date concluded that they were the decapitated skulls of deformed children. This conclusion, however, just raises more questions. We will keep you posted on further information discovered regarding the site. Thanks for watching, guys, and until next time, take care. In 1977, archaeologists in Poland discovered the astonishing remains of what is now being confirmed was a medieval female giant. It is surprising that the remains survived long enough to be confirmed as an anomaly without mysteriously going missing. But measuring only 7 foot 2 inches, it may have been presumed that she was just abnormally large. Examinations of her remains, still in situ, have concluded that she was thrown into her burial site without much care, as if hunted, killed and buried. She has been named Ostrautomsky, and her remains are located on a lake island, half-hour drive from Poznan. The island includes an ancient palace, church and fortifications. The island has been inhabited since the late Stone Age and the ruins are shrouded in legend. One intriguing ancient story tells of an unknown king, who rests together with his knights at the bottom of the lake. While all other burials in the island's cemetery are made with the head facing west, this giant woman was buried facing in the opposite direction. Maybe they believed her kind to be cursed. Many ancient tribes and cultures still retain stories about a long forgotten existence of a race of humans that were much taller and stronger than ordinary men. These giants are described as both brave and barbaric, and legends often mention their cruelty. Plenty of these tales can be found in South America. The Peyote, a tribe from the Nevada region thousands of years ago, had a legend about a race of red-haired giants called the Sea Tika. The ancestors of the Peyote described them as savage and inhospitable cannibals. In the Northern Peyote language, Sea Tika literally means stew leaders. The legend states that the giants came from a distant land, crossing the ocean on rafts built out of the Tule plant. This legend repeats itself all over the Americas. In the 16th century, Pedro Cesar de Leon recorded an ancient Peruvian tale regarding the origin of the South American giants. According to locals, they also came by sea in rafts of reeds. Some of the men were so tall that from the knee down they were as big as an ordinary man. They tell of the giants waging war on the Peyote and all neighboring tribes, spreading terror and devastation. Finally, the tribes united against their common enemy and decimated them. The last remaining red-haired giant sought shelter inside a large cave. The tribes eventually started a fire at the entrance, suffocating the giants. 
In 1886, a mining engineer named John T. Reed happened to hear the legend from a group of pits while prospecting near Lovelock, Nevada. The Indians told him that the legend was real and that the cave was located nearby. When he found the cave himself, he was unable to begin digging. News soon spread regarding the discovery of Lovelock Cave. But the attention was profit-driven, a guano deposit was discovered inside, and soon after, in 1911, a company started excavating the precious resource shipping more than 250 tons to a fertilizer company in San Francisco. Any artifacts that may have been discovered were probably neglected and lost. However, many may have been stolen away under the guise of fertilizer prospecting, indeed the company may have all along been a Smithsonian ruse, to steal the artifacts from within the cave. After the surface layer of guano had been mined, and the best amongst the smaller relics stolen, strange objects were officially recorded. An official excavation was performed in 1912 by the University of California and 1924. Reports told of thousands of artifacts being recovered, some of them being truly unusual. After a full excavation, removing the entire guano deposit, mummified remains of several red-haired, ancient giants, were found buried in the cave. Measuring between 8 to 10 feet in height, these mummies have since been referred to as the Lovelock Giants. Another intriguing find was a pair of 15-inch long sandals that showed signs of having been worn. Allegedly, other unusually large items were recovered but have since been locked away in museum warehouses and private collections. Including the Giants, only a few remnants of the amazing discovery remains in public display. A piece of evidence that remains on site until this day is a giant hand print, embedded on a boulder inside Lovelock Cave. Made by a giant hand that was covered in soot. Around the same time as the second Lovelock Cave excavation, another dig revealed amazing finds. According to a 1931 article published in the Nevada Review Minor, two giant skeletons had been found buried in a dry lake bed close to Lovelock, Nevada. The oversized remains measured 8.5 and 10 feet in height, and also, what I feel is the most interesting fact of all, were mummified in a manner similar to the one employed by ancient Egyptians. The common trait between these mummified giant remains, and others recorded in the archives of rare preliminary press articles, discovered as far south as Lake Titicaca, is the presence of red hair. While some scientists believe the reddish color is a result of the interaction with the environment in which they were buried, the mummies verify the legends, which describe the sea Tika and their kin as living red-haired giants. With so many remains now missing, it is up to all of us, to collaborate the proof of our mysterious history.